Oh. Hello. So, uh, welcome to the third day of uh, the No Tanks um, Dry Sessions. I um, had a really good response from yesterday. So yesterday we were uh, looking at using ETT for uh, technique and strength to do with um, equalization at depth. And uh, I gave you all a homework. So uh, hopefully you're going to put uh, some comments in the underneath, both uh, for yesterday and today talking about how you found the ETT. Also, if did you lay down on your back and try and blow the balloon? Did anybody give any, uh, get any, um, any, uh, uh, any interesting results from trying to blow up a balloon laying on, on their back? And as I said yesterday, it's about awareness. Now, awareness is the number one thing, no matter what you're trying to do, whatever you're trying to learn, whatever you're trying to learn, it's super important. Awareness is king. Right? You have to be aware of what you're doing. So the three A's that we have in our training, awareness is king. It's the first thing. You have to be aware of what you're doing. But then you have to acknowledge what you're doing. So, for instance, if you're doing a stretching exercise, you have to be aware of uh, the stretch. Then you have to take 10, 20 seconds after the stretch to acknowledge what you've done. And only then can the body adapt. So tonight I promised we're going to do uh, bedtime stretches, which is um, obviously a stretch. So this is why I'm covering uh, covering the three A's. So the body doesn't adapt while we're doing the stretch. The body adapts when we're asleep at night. And that goes for everything. If you're going for a run in the park, um, the, body, the body doesn't build muscle when you're running. The body builds muscle when you're sleeping. So it's important to... Uh, be aware of the run that you're doing. So I tend not to like um, to wear headphones. I tend not to tell people to wear headphones. Oh, sorry, as I just mentioned, a little bit dark on this side of my face. <laughs> That's a little bit better. So I, uh, I tend to suggest that you don't wear headphones because you want to focus on yourself and not focus on the outside, even when you're running. So when you're running, you want to acknowledge what you're doing. Be aware, sorry, you want to be aware of what you're doing. You really want to be conscious of what, you, what you're doing. And this goes back to the first day that we talked about purposeful or meaningful practice. So you're really aware of what you're doing. Then you have to acknowledge what you're doing. And uh, in if you're using the running example, it's very easy to acknowledge what you've done. You can eat. Uh, eat some protein, get uh, drink, hydrate, and really spend some time thinking about what you've done and what you want the body to, to do. And then when you go to bed at night, when you sleep, then the body will uh, adapt. So awareness is king, followed by acknowledgement. And then third off, you have um, uh, the adaptation. So tonight, um, uh, let's go through our 10 key points of training. So uh, let's start with, so uh, the first day we had meaningful practice. So uh, practice 10,000 hours, you hear people say this, um, but it only works if you practice 10,000 hours, if it's purposeful or meaningful practice. Last night we mentioned about uh, failure. Now, failure is super important. If you can't, if you don't fail, if you can't fail, then uh, there's no challenge. There's no, um, there's no way you can learn. Okay? So meaningful practice means you have to have uh, the possibility of failure. So I've drawn a line there. And uh, let's go back to uh, tonight. So I'm going to be talking about feedback. Again, you cannot learn, you cannot progress without feedback okay? and this is what we're talking i was talking a minute ago about awareness aware of what you're doing there needs to be some sort of feedback else you can't correct yourself um, so feedback is what we want and uh, a great example um, is that i found that i use to tell people is a simple thing of golf so if you play a round of golf you are going to effectively you're not going to learn anything you're not going to improve just by playing a round of golf 
So what professional golfers do, they'll get a, a bag of balls and they'll hit from the, from the tee, they'll hit the first ball and they'll see where it goes. And then they'll have nine opportunities to change things, to look at their, uh, the, uh, what they've done, uh, be aware of it. That's where the feedback is. So they hit another ball from exactly the same place and another ball from exactly the same place and another ball. For, so they've had an opportunity for nine pieces of feedback to change. Or in fact, they've had 10 pieces of feedback, but they've been able to change that nine times because they've hit the ball 10 times. And it's the same with free diving. So if you just swim uh, a long distance or short distance or a depth, and then you get out of the pool, you have not got any feedback. You have not got any opportunity to use that feedback. So you will need to do multiple dives, whether that's uh, technical. So in a no tank pool session, we tend to find people will be um, tend to find no I tell people <laughs> to do an exercise once twice three times and then to be aware of what they're doing so they can change it and my job as a coach is to say hey uh, why don't you try doing it like this why don't you try doing it like that so that do it, do it again and it, it may not be better I might say try a little bit quicker and and it might not be not might not be as good or try a little bit slower it might not be as good and there's where the failure is but that's the repeating of it you've got the, the, the opportunity for that feedback and you can be aware of what you're changing and how it's changing so it's super important that feedback um moving forward uh today um we're going to be looking at uh, adaptation so out of the 10 um, aspects of free dive training we have uh, in the no tank system we have uh, 10 aspects and today's aspect we're going to be looking at adaptation um, particularly in stretching so adaptation to depth with uh, stretching so yesterday we looked at the ETT which was working on a technique and strength and the third part is flexibility which is what we're going to be looking at today with the bedtime stretches and this is a stretch a thoracic stretch um, for for depth right? and ultimately uh, this is the, the this will determine the limit at which you can uh, equalize to so here's a story I was in Nice, uh, we're outside SEPA, so that's Louis Lefemme's club that I started at, and uh, Guillaume Neri was there, and he asked me, uh, Marcus, I I've had a couple of years off, I want to go back to deep diving, to competitive diving, have you got any exercises that I can do uh, to practice uh, depth without having to go deep? I've had a couple of years off, so I've got a very limited amount of uh, dives uh, to, to, to a depth, to a target depth. Have you got any exercises that I could do to help? And I said, yeah, uh, I can give you the bedtime stretches. So I went through the bedtime stretches. And remember, this is sitting dry. There's no water involved after a session. And he did the bedtime stretches, did everything that I, I'm going to explain to you, and kind of went, oh, wow. That feels like being at 120 meters. And I said, yeah, that's that's kind of the whole point. And after that, uh, if anybody out there knows uh, their free dive history, uh, you'll know that he went on to the world championships and did an amazing dive to 100 and, uh, 139 meters. It was a mistake. It was meant to be 129 meters. And afterwards, he said, he usually stops because of his equalization. The last few meters, he usually he gets his alarm, but but um, he gets his alarm, but it's his um, equalization that ultimately stops him. Sorry, I've just had a, uh, something coming in saying that there's the connection has been lost. Uh, Can anybody hear me? Am I actually talking out, out into the world? 
Mm. Yeah, we still have you. So uh, Ted's got me, so I'll carry on. So, uh, yeah, so uh, Guillaume did this dive uh, to 139 metres, and his equalisation wasn't a problem. That was not what stopped him. I say it was a mistake, so unfortunately it wasn't ratified as a world record for various reasons, but effectively he had uh, kind of sorted out his equalisation issues. So now it's just uh, time and, and, and stress of the dive. So I'm going to teach you that tonight. Okay, and this is a, a stretch. So let's have a look at what happens when we go deep. When we go deep, the pressure pushes on, on the chest and collapses the chest uh, where the lungs are. So uh, I have got a graphic up, but apparently it didn't come up on the screen for you, which is a bit of a pity. I can't show you it because it's on my computer screen. Okay. So the chest uh, gets compressed, the lungs get compressed, and we have no nerve endings in the lungs. We don't know, we can't feel what's going on in the lungs. So they just get compressed. And down to 30 meters, uh, there's, we don't feel anything. It's the same as breathing out. Normally we get down to residual volume. So down to 30 meters, the lungs react exactly the same way as if you just breathe out. <sighs> Okay, that's me at 30 meters. My lungs have gone down to residual volume, and, and that's it. As we go further than that, the, the lungs still will keep, will, uh, keep compressing, and the chest will keep moving in. Um, but there's no uh, pain sensors uh, in the lungs, so we, we don't know um, if, they're, if they're coping all right. The only thing we can tell is by testing it. So if we unpack and we can move air out, then there's flexibility in the rib cage. If we can't unpack, so yesterday we were talking about using the ETT and unpacking. So mm. making a noise, super important you make the noise, because as I said yesterday, if you make the noise, you can, you know you've may have pulled some air out of the lungs. And this means the rib cage is flexing in and you're good to go. You can equalize and you can carry on. If you can't equalize, obviously you get pain in years and you stop the dive. That's it. That's it. Easy, pain, and we stop. There is a very scary situation out there uh, that people are teaching an ex uh, a technique called mouth fill. Now, mouth fill gets around this pain in years by preloading. Uh, so preloading or pre-unloading, pre-unpacking, something like that. Uh, the, the the air from the lungs. So if you have to uh, circumnavigate the pain in years or the, the ability to unpack at depth, if you have to circumnavigate that by using um, mouthfeel, you are damaging your lungs. If you use mouthfeel, you are dam damaging your lungs. There's no two ways about it unless you can dive to 70 or 80 meters without using mouth fill. This means the rib cage is flexible enough to go down to anything you want. 70 or 80 meters, it's it's compressed in, you're good to go. So you can use mouth fill to go deeper because we know you've got the flexibility in your chest. But if you use mouth fill shallower than that, you are damaging your lungs. No two ways about it. And the thing is, because you've got no pain receptors in the lungs, you don't know. So people are teaching it to people who are very shallow. Uh, and because they they say, well, they go on a holiday, go on a trip, and they go, well, I want to go deeper, I want to go deeper. I'll have this. It's an instant fix. It's an instant fix to go deeper. And it is. It gets you deeper. But it is guaranteed to damage your lungs. So well, what's the answer then, Marcus? The answer is not to use the trick, not to use that gimmick, and to use long, the, the proper way, which takes a long time, the long flexibility exercises. And you can practice these at home, and you can practice them dry, and you can practice them during lockdown. And I'm going to tell you how. So to, this means you don't have to do mouthfeel. You can avoid mouthfeel, and you can just uh, get the flexibility, uh, increase the flexibility. Now, we're talking about flexibility here, or I'm talking about flexibility here. We're talking about uh, thoracic flexibility. So you've got a rib cage that's moving, <clears throat> and uh, the breastplate uh, is joined to the ribs 
here and there's a join. I call it a cartilitic stretch. Uh, there's a join, but it's uh, it's surrounding cartilage. It's not really a cartilitic uh, join, but there's cartilage around. That's why I call it a cartilitic stretch. And we're trying to make that flexibility go in. So as a rib, as a breastplate moves in, the ribs move in like this. Okay. So cartilitic stretching takes a long time. It takes a long, long time. So you have to be doing this every day and if you've never done it before the first time you do it you won't feel anything second time you won't feel anything you'll you'll have to be doing this exercise maybe six seven times before you can actually feel what it's doing so uh, bedtime stretches you're going to be doing bedtime stretches uh, every day for at least a month before you'll you'll see some results all right there will be results. You will be getting more flexible, but you won't necessarily see it, okay? Because there's tiny little flexibility uh, uh, increments. But after a month, you'll be able to see it. And hopefully, uh, I can get Adam to post uh, one of his flexibility demonstrations. If you can record it, Adam, and put it in the uh, put it in the in the comments, a link to it, that would be fantastic. So Adam can really show you how the flexibility can can build up in the chest. Okay, so without further ado, let's do the bedtime stretches. So, first off, we're going to start by exhaling all the air. So we get down to the residual volume. So we get down to like, say, 30 meters, uh, effective 30 meters in depth. And then we're going to cause more pressure on the chest. And how do you call more, cause more pressure on the chest? Well, you reduce the amount of pressure inside so the chest moves in. And how do we do that? we push our belly out, okay? So, oh, didn't think of this. <laughs> You're gonna have to see my belly. So, okay, so uh, to reduce the uh, pressure in the chest, okay, we're gonna push the belly out like this, that movement there, okay? So we start by emptying the lungs, uh, and then we push the belly out. Now, I suggest to people, especially when you start this, if you lean forwards, it helps push out a little bit more air, especially if you've not done this before, because you're not going to have so much uh, control over the diaphragm or even as much uh, uh, strength. Okay? So technique, the control, and the strength of the diaphragm. They're the two things. So we can help that by leaning forward and squeezing out. So again, I'm going to do it again like we did last night. I'm going to describe it, demonstrate it, and then chat while you uh, give it a go. So first thing I'm going to do is going to lean forward, squeezing out the air. I'm going to hold my nose. You don't have to do that if you've done this a few times, but first time you do it, just make sure there's no air kind of sneaking in through the nose. So lean forwards, hold the nose, sit up straight, push my belly out. Okay, now, I don't know whether you can see uh, my whole body while I'm doing this. Uh, do this seated, by the way. Do it seated. I'm going to do it standing, otherwise you won't be able to see my belly. But you can do it seated. So, uh, I'm going to take a little bit. Okay, so, I'm breathing out. So I breathe out completely, leaning forwards, and I sat up straight, and I put my shoulders back, okay? You don't want to be hunched in like this. You want to put your shoulders back, and I push my belly out. And I didn't see it, but maybe you saw my chest go in a little bit. Okay, so now this is your opportunity to do this. So sitting at home, what I want you to do is exactly this. Lean forwards, breathing out. Hold the nose. Just stop cheating. Sit up straight, put your shoulders back, then push out your belly once, push out your belly twice, and then lean forwards to allow the air to come back in. Okay, and that's one bedtime stretch. And in the, every day, you want to do three bedtime stretches. So you do that once, then you do it twice, and then you do a trachea sweat, stretch, which I have, I'm going to demonstrate uh, in a second. So while I'm chatting, I want you to give it a go again. 
So I want you to breathe out completely, leaning forwards, hold the nose, sit up straight, shoulders back, push the belly out. And you should feel the stretch down here or one particular point. And again, and lean forwards, sit up and breathe. Now, where you feel the, the, the stretch is your tensest part in your, in your body. So if you've had a, an injury on a rib, then it'll probably feel the stretch there. If you keep doing it, you keep doing it, eventually that'll become uh, as flexible as the rest of the body, uh, the rest of the ribs, and then you'll feel it somewhere else. Most people feel it just in here, first time they do it in the clavicular movements, okay? That's fine, you keep doing it, you keep doing it. Eventually it will move around. And you should feel eventually a nice stretch both uh, down both sides and maybe at the sides as well. So that's your first two. The third one is a trachea stretch. Very simple. Again, I'll describe it, demonstrate it, and then you can have a go. So you lean forwards, breathe out completely, same as before, hold your nose, sit up, shoulders back, and then push your belly out just a little bit to feel a little bit of tension in the chest. Okay, so there's a vacuum in there, so it's not allowing uh, any more movement. And then we lift the head up. And you should feel the trachea, which is a whole set of semicircles uh, of cartilage around the throat, and they should start moving in. Right? Don't, don't uh, go do this until you feel pain, okay? You should feel a stretch, but no pain. Okay? This takes a long time, so just do it every day. We call them bedtime stretches because it's something you can do just before bed, but you can also do it any time of the day. And in fact, I'm looking for um, an app designer to design just uh, an email, like, to, like an app that's just a random thing every time, every day, and it sends it to the same, to the same time to everybody in the world. Um, so if you just get this app, it just goes, bing, random point in the day, at the same time, bedtime stretches, and, and then you can kind of click on it and say you've done it. Uh, one guy did come back with, with a system and it was really complicated. We had to have uh, databases and stuff. And I'm like, no, nah, it's got to be an easier way of doing this. So if you're an, a web, uh, an app designer, uh, message me or put your comments at the bottom. Okay, so uh, trickier stretch. Here we go. And I will, uh, yeah, I'll stand up so you can see the chest going in. Here we go. So breathing out. And there we go. That's how long you should hold it for. So give it a go. Breathe out completely. Hold your nose. Sit up. Put a little bit of pressure. Tricky to stretch. And hold it for about as long as I did. And put yourself back. Fantastic. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to cover is the screaming stretch. So if you've done the bedtime stretches for a few times, maybe uh, five to ten times, and you've got the hang of the bedtime stretches, you know what it feels like, you know what you're trying to do, you can move on to the screaming stretch. So I'm covering it now purely uh, as, a, as an add-on. You can come back and watch the video later and, and maybe do it in uh, next week. So the screaming stretch is just... Um, a simplified version if you can already control your diaphragm and you've got enough strength to do it. Okay. Screaming stretch um, is you you breathe out. You don't have to breathe out completely because obviously you're a little bit better at it by now, so you don't have to breathe out everything. And then you start breathing in, making a screaming sound, and then you just stop the screaming sound, but keep trying to breathe in. Okay. Um, and, uh, and 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 that's it. So I'm going to do a screaming stretch for you, and I'm going to take my shirt off so you can possibly see uh, the the movement in my chest. So if I sit at this angle, you should see. I'm going to do a screaming stretch. You should see my chest. Well, let's just move the microphone out of the way just a little bit. You should see uh, the chest moving in. Okay, so here we go. Uh. 
Okay, so I did two there. You heard the scream, I stopped it, I carried on trying to breathe in, and you could see the chest going down. So let's do it a little bit of an angle like this and see if you can see it again. Uh. There you go. So I'm also going to put a link in the uh, in the comments uh, in the uh, in the description uh, to a dive I did a few years ago, which I filmed. Uh, it was a sled dive. It was I was trying to uh, do a 102 meter dive in real time, so film it in real time to give somebody an idea what it feels like to do a 100, 102 meter dive. But the interesting thing was the camera angle, you could see my chest bending in. And in fact, that camera angle was only shot, uh, wasn't shot all the way down to 102, it was only down to like 60 or 70 meters or something. And already you could see the chest coming in and you can see my wetsuit flapping around as the chest had gone in. So again, as we said yesterday uh, about diaphragmatic stretches, they're good for you, but they're not going to help you go any deeper because the chest moves in this way. And so I'll put a link in the in the in the comments in my description to that video. Really nice camera above me. And you can just see my chest going in and in and in and in, and then my wetsuit just flapping around. And I say that shot was only filmed down to like seventy meters or something. Not maybe maybe even sixty. I don't know. Okay, so that's the guided exercise. So uh, what am I going to get you to do uh, tonight? So. As I said yesterday, you should be holding your breath every single day. All right? There's no reason why you shouldn't be holding your breath. You can build up your tolerance to CO2. You can um, maybe if you do certain exercises, you can build up your um, uh, tolerance to low O2, although it's very hard to, to kind of replicate that. But more importantly, it's awareness. It's you being aware of what it feels like. So if you've had a really hard day at work and you've uh, and you've cycled home and you're a little bit knackered, uh, just do a breath hold and see what it feels like to, to, to have a breath hold that's in a hard situation. Or if you've just been watching Netflix all day and, and you've been chilling, I'm going to do a breath hold. Do a breath hold and see what it feels like. Make notes in your diary. Uh, keep saying to everybody, keep a training diary. Make notes in your training diary. Compare the two. So you've got the awareness between the two and acknowledge what they are. Acknowledge when you're hungry, when you're watching telly, when you're, um, the dog's jumping on your lap. Acknowledge that these things, how they affect you. Sometimes they affect you for good, sometimes they affect you for bad. But if you don't, if you're not aware of them, then you can't uh, acknowledge them. If you can't acknowledge them, then you can't adapt your training or yourself to these different things. So super, super important. Um, I asked everybody to do the lazy tables yesterday, and, and I'm going to do the lazy tables in the guided exercise um, tomorrow. So this is why I want you to do it a couple of times. So uh, if you haven't got the lazy tables, uh, hit me up, as it were, um, or just just message me uh, on Facebook, and I'll send you a copy of the lazy tables. You can go through them maybe uh, twice tomorrow. And tomorrow we'll be going through the lazy tables and I'll be describing in great detail why you should do them and how you can do them and how the system works around them. So that's 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 uh, your homework is to do lazy tables again before tomorrow. Uh, and that's your breath hold homework. And your theory homework is I would very much like you to uh, have a look at. Uh, the Theories by Tony Buzan, okay? So this is his first book, a uh, massive bestseller. I've got about uh, six of his books. And to be really honest, uh, the first one or two were very good. And then the rest were just expansions of chapters out of this book, okay? The speed reading book and uh, the memory book, they're just chapters in this book that he's expanded to a book. So uh, get yourself a copy of Use Your Head, uh, by Tony Buzan. Uh, that's your theory um, homework. He's famous for uh, coming up with mind maps, designing mind maps, inventing mind maps. In fact, mind maps is a trademark of Tony Buzan, and uh, you can't um, use them uh, without giving credit to him or paying him uh, or his his, uh, his estate, as it were. So I think I've done everything. I'm looking around, just going, so we've got um, homework for tomorrow night, uh, for tomorrow, lazy tables and theory, uh, look into uh, Tony Buzan, use your head, uh, 
and bedtime stretches. Bedtime stretches every day. You should be doing one breath hold and one exercise every day. Breath hold and uh, and a, and a, some sort of stretch or something, cardio uh, or something like that. And excellent. So we'll see you tomorrow. And I'll also cover why standard uh, breathing exercises are good for people with um, breathing issues, so uh, such as asthma or if you've got um, an injured lung. Uh, and I'll go through why these are good for us and how to use them in those circumstances. So uh, does that relate to the situation we're in, breathing issues? I think I think it does. So see you tomorrow for day four. Um, stay safe. Bye.